Hey, this is Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. I'm coming to you today from the Freedom Tower at the beautiful Liberty University campus. I came here for the Creation Research Society annual summer conference. You, many of you know that I'm on the board of directors, so I'm here as representative of the society, and we've got a great group of people. It's one of our largest meetings we've ever had. Some amazing, amazing presentations. Yesterday we had workshops. We had a a geology workshop, they went on a field trip, we had a um, astronomy workshop, they went up to the observatory, and I hosted the biology workshop. And we went through um, about six hours of talking about some really interesting things in creation. And a lot of things I presented here already, I threw up on the screen for us to discuss. And we had, um, one of my friends gave a presentation on baromenology, that's the study of the baromins, the created kinds that God created um, in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, that is basically, we're trying to approach this mathematically, seeing where the boundaries between the groups are, and coming up with some really interesting results and fascinating graphs and ideas. Uh, this morning, I actually had the honor of presenting the plenary ple presentation. I gave my speeches were designed to change talk, which is a series of articles on creation.com and a series of videos here on biblical genetics that many of you have seen. If not, go back and watch them. They're really good. Uh, basically, I said species were designed to change by God, the intelligent engineer who is amazing, who is complicated, who put redundancy into the genomes of his creations on purpose. He put uh, hidden information in the form of recessive alleles in his creation. He gave the ability for sexual recombination to rearrange chromosomal segments and therefore bring up new gene combinations that did not exist at creation but could appear later on. And he also intelligently engineered the system knowing the laws of chemistry and knowing the laws of probability, he put specific letters in specific places to either allow them to change in the future, because DNA is always being attacked by water and oxygen and things like that, or to be much less likely to change because some letters don't change as much as others. For instance, the C to T mutation is the most common mutation we see in genetics because cytosine can be deaminated, at which point it becomes uracil, and then the DNA repair enzymes sometimes fix that as a thymine. So we have a C to T change very frequently. God knew this. When he wrote out those genomes, he knew what was going to happen over time, and therefore he allowed for some things to change more than others and in different ways. I also introduced my 4D Barrowman concept and my braided Barrowman concept, which I've also presented here on, on this channel, uh, where we can take the created kinds and categorize them according to how much diversity God put into those creations, how many individuals he created, and how much geographic continuity they have. So humans, we know we started with two people and only two people. There's a limited amount of genetic diversity. And as we grew from that place of the 8 billion people alive today, well, there's a limit to how much genetic diversity we can see amongst us. There are also some other Organisms that are monotypic, like the duckbill platypus, it's the only one in its group. The echidna, the, or the spiny anteater, it's the only one in its group. And we don't see a lot of morphological differentiation in the fossil record. Yeah, platypuses used to be twice as big as they are now, but that's not really a big change. And I tried to put a cap on the limits to the amount of change. So no, I don't think whales evolve from legged animals because the genetic information and the probability of that situation would be really problematic, especially in a young Earth context. There simply hasn't been enough time for such changes, and the genetic programming just isn't there. But we can have a lot of change, uh, significant amounts. Uh, it's color, size, behavior, and all sorts of other things we see in the natural world that fits into the biblical creation idea. Because God created species to change. Change is part of creationism. Change is not proof of evolution. And by the way, if you hear some elevator noise in the background, that's okay. This is the Freedom Tower, the highest point around, and people are constantly going up to the top level to see um, the vista of the mountains and, and the town. It's just so pretty here. The group of people getting off right now, so I might have to pause for a minute. So this week we're having talks on geology, biology, astronomy, barominology, the word of the study of the created kinds, theology, different design aspects. We've got people from different countries that are here people from all different levels of expertise, a whole bunch of, of doctoral level scientists and master's level scientists and people working on their master's and their doctorates. In fact, I, as a, the um, membership secretary of the society, 
I counted up, we have 600 PhD and master's level people in our society from all different disciplines. Now that's not large compared to like the American Academy of Science or a lot of other scientific affiliation organizations, but 600 people who have said, yes, I'm a young earth creationist and I want to be part of this society. We have an additional six or seven, maybe 800 non-scientists, some people with just bachelor level degrees or degrees that don't quite qualify to be a voting member, but they're also members of our society. They just can't vote on Society Matters. And they've also said, hey, we want to be a part of the society. If you would like to find out about membership in the Creation Research Society, just go to creationresearch.org and just start clicking around. It'll be right there. It'll be pretty obvious. Tomorrow, I'm going to be treated to a talk on the SARS-CoV-2 genome and how the multi-year record of change indicates degeneration. Oh, that's gonna be exciting. I actually helped on this project a little bit, but a, a virologist, a PhD in virology, and I worked on the genomics of the system. And yeah, the thing is adapting to the human condition. It is spreading faster, it's becoming more infectious. This is true. But at the same time, the rest of the genome is mutating and it's slowly randomizing. It's not becoming a better virus. It's just becoming, in one sense, more able to infect humans in another sense is rusting out. It's sort of like you take a car and change the engine, make it faster, but you forgot to wash it. And so now it's starting to rust and fall apart everywhere else. That's basically what this virus is, is going through, but it's the early stages. And so we're just starting to see it now. It's basically following the track of the human H1N1 influenza virus that I've talked about before and that I've written about before that basically went extinct because of mutation accumulation. Because after 10 or 12% of its genome mutated, it couldn't reproduce effectively anymore and certainly couldn't compete with the other circulating influenza strains. I'm also looking forward to one of my friends giving a talk on the mitochondria of worms. Yeah, the segmented worms, the annelids. They're a very interesting group, fascinating, not very well studied in some ways. And so he's going to do an analysis on the mitochondria of the segmented worms. I'm also going to have another person I just met. I, I corresponded with him a little bit, but I just literally met him yesterday. The age of Y chromosome Adam from the genetic data alone. And then another talk tracing Neanderthal descent from Noah. How do we explain Neanderthals in a young earth context? How do we get them to be so different so quickly, so soon after the flood? Well, here's a critical thinker. He's working on this idea and uh, perhaps I'll be able to give you a summary in a couple of days on what I learned, but that's it for now. I just want to encourage you that science is amazing, creation is amazing, and you should be part of some group of study. It's hard to be out there alone. You don't have to be alone. There are people willing to be friends and to encourage and to admonish and to uh, just build ideas on. Maybe you just want to sit and, and, and watch. A lot of people at our conference are not actually giving talks, but they're here because they want to learn and they want to be encouraged. So think about coming to a, a society meeting. In fact, next year, next summer is the, the ICC or the International Conference on Creation. This will be the first time it's being hosted at Cedarville University. Uh, abstracts are due later in, I think, August-ish, but you can just type in International Conference on Creationism in Google and it'll bring up the website. You can learn how to attend, how to submit a paper if you're interested. There's some amazing ideas out there. I mean, I learned things about plate tectonics today that I had no idea of. I learned things about the Earth's magnetic field that was fascinating, amazing like the number of magnetic reversals and people working on models to explain how the Earth's magnetic field can collapse and reform in the opposite direction in just a matter of days, because that's actually what the geological record tells us, that the reversals are very fast. So I'm gonna go back to the conference now. I just had a little break and I wanna get back before we start up again. Go to creationresearch.org and learn more about the society or go to Creation Ministries International's website, creation.com, and you can learn more about me. That's where my bio is and a lot of things that I've published and produced. You can also go to biblicalgenetics.com. That's just a little a site where I keep all my videos that you're watching now or listening to if you're listening on podcast. Y'all have a blessed day.